Wow, that sounded crazy, didn't it? Sweet. Well, I, I still have a cold. It's lingering, but it's much better. Much better. Termites. Oh, so many things, termites. How was your week? How was everybody's week? Uh, good? Good. We need to, right out of the gate, we need to vote on a new queen. I'm not retiring Tanya, but she's semi-retired. Because she, she just does her road things, but she doesn't call, she doesn't bring enough news to the table. Nope. And nor should she have to. She's nope. older. Well, so are these other people. Some of these other people. But mm-hmm. Stevie and Sherry ain't ever going to shut up. No. Um, so we need to vote on a new queen. Okay. It could be a dude. Mm-hmm. Doesn't, have to be a, doesn't have to be a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I've rolled through some in my head, and I'm not. You're not getting it? I'm not, I'm not picking up anything just yet. No. I even searched Twitter and Instagram. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Um, okay, so, well, just saying, let's get the vote going. Come on, throw some suggestions. You guys are part of this. Let's help. Help, help me out. All right, uh, where were we? We were in Virginia Beach. What? Uh, me and, um, uh, well, my friend, and well, my friend Kelly McFarland, uh, an emergency came up, so she couldn't come, so I got Andrew Stanley, and he came, uh, to D.C., but I couldn't get anybody to Virginia Beach, so I did the whole show by myself. So the termites there got an extra 20 minutes of me. Um, it went great. They were a great crowd. It's a Standler Performing Arts Center. It's like in one, the funny bones, I call them fake cities. I don't know what you want to call it, but one of those areas where, you know, it's the same town to town. It's the same. There's right. the Irish pub, the fake Irish pub. Well, it's real, the but PFJ. I mean, yeah, the PF, I love PFJ. I like everything in there. Yard house. Love it. Love yeah, the yard house. Great chicken sandwich. Um, so there, I received some hot sauce from Leslie. That's going to be shipped. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I could get that through. Even <laughs> Delta, even Delta Schmelta, I think would be like, lady, I don't know about that. Um, Daisy brought me a very nice candle and some peanuts. Dale uh, brought Old Bay Goldfish hot sauce and these cookies that are famous in Baltimore. You're supposed to heat them up. I did not do that. Burgers. But burgers, cookies from Baltimore. How come Lewis hasn't told me about these? He's from Baltimore. Well, actually, Lewis is from Silver Springs. Silver oh. Spring, Maryland. That's what Stevie's song is about. Lou didn't even know that. Are you kidding? No, she said that they were riding by one day, and it said Silver Spring, Maryland. She thought that sounded like a lovely place. So then she wrote the song <laughs> about Lindsay. Wow. You could be my Silver Spring, meaning my wonderful place. But you didn't, Lindsay, did you? No, you fucked it up. No. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Lou was 75 years old. You didn't even know that. Wow. Even when I sent it, he's like, I don't understand what this means. Come on, Lou. <laughs> Give me the program. Uh, oh, these are really good. Really? Yeah. What did I taste like? Well, they're more my mom. Tastes like a brownie. Oh. Mm-hmm. But sweeter than a brownie. Oh. Wow. Uh, yeah, those are going my mom. Okay. Because she loves the sweets. Um, and then I met um, some uh, guy, gay guys from Lake of the Ozarks. Well, they have a place at Lake of the Ozarks. Yeah. They're very nice, so they're gay lake termites, so technically they're germites. Germites. <laughs> I like it. Um, <laughs> but they tr- they're trying to upgrade me on my gummy bears. Uh-huh. These are called Albany. She said, in our, he, they said, in our house, these are fancy gummy bears, just in case you hate them. We got some hair boost, too. Uh-huh. I got a lot of bears. Yeah. All right. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I appreciate you guys buying them because I wouldn't have bought them because mm-hmm. I'm too loyal to my hair bow. I think I'm supposed to be saying bow. That lady told bow. me. Yeah, hair yeah. bow. I always said booze. Whatever. Booze. Hair booze. Harry's. Call them Harry's. Harry Bears. Um, yeah. No. I don't know. Gluten free, maybe that's the problem. So they're the hair bow. Well, I'm, are they? Yeah. I appreciate. It's and jealous. they were fun to talk to. Um, I'm at them. So that was super fun. Shout out to Virginia Beach and everybody that was there. I think that was everybody. That was John and Jacob, the Grimmites. <laughs> yeah, and I know where their lake house is, but it's kind of far from mine. But I could meet them halfway at a place called Papa Chubby's. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's Lake Talk. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. um, then moving on to D.C., mm-hmm. um, the Warner Theater is one of my favorite places. It's one of what I call my marquee gigs, yeah. where you're just like, you can't even believe you made it that far in your life. And so it was great. sold out, no problem. I don't know, it seems like 2,500 people, I guess. Mm-hmm. And Andrew was there. He's so funny. A lot of people ask who was the opening act. His name is Andrew Stanley. Yep. You can go look him up online. We'll put him in the show. He's very funny. He's a homeschooler. 
I love the homeschoolers. What? <laughs> <laughs> he got homeschooled. And it, one of his jokes is, so basically I know everything my mom knows. <laughs> 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 yeah, I never thought about that, like that, that they wouldn't, well, they would know more, I guess. But anyway, it's funny. He's a funny guy, and I was glad he could do it. And I'm sorry for my friend Kelly. Um, emergencies suck. It's just a lot of things on the road lately. A lot of people, oh, so myself included, mm-hmm. with, you know, parents. And I saw Leanne Morgan had to cancel shows because they're um, her little precious daddy. I just love her southern talk. She's bawling her eyes out, but she still has time for these adjectives. Like, <laughs> my little precious daddy. He's in the hospital, y'all. I got to go home. It was heartbreaking, yeah. but I'm like, yep, these are the calls on the road where you're like, full stop. Yep. Let's yep. go back. Yep. What have you guys done now? <laughs> um, so the, I'm drinking this. Uh, it's called Brunch Crunch. It looks like Fruit Loops. It's great. It's from uh, Maryland again, but it was brought to me by Cam and Melissa, who also brought some Old Bay chips. Old Bay chips are hard to find, yeah. and I did happen to give um, one of the bags to the lady that works the door, the mm-hmm. backstage door. You would have thought I handed her a, a pot of gold because she's like, you can't find these anywhere. They, they're not even online. They're all sold out. I'm like, I don't know about all that, but my termites are finding a lot of them. Uh, based on Paula from Pittsburgh, came from Pittsburgh. They brought um, this moonshine, which uh, we'll be through all the thank yous quickly, so don't worry. You can fast forward and we'll get right on up to, up to. Tall Pines Distillery, nice. 2014, handcrafted moonshine. Um and some barbecue sauce. Lisa, Kira, and Anita, a Guinness pint glass, and the Guinness Blonde Beer, which I already drank. That was delicious. <laughs> it is delicious, and people should know if you think Guinness is too much, go for a blonde. Yeah. Yeah. Made, yeah. Um, you know that? Made in Baltimore? Yeah. Yes. Cool. A lot of things, sneaky things going on in Baltimore. Yeah. Lewis, that Lewis isn't telling me about. Sneaky. Yeah, he was all excited about his Orioles. <laughs> 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 And he won't, he won't accept the Ravens. Lewis will not accept them, his fanship. He's going all in on the Commanders, which is even sadder. Yeah, he should go for the Ravens. The Commanders are a mess. Yeah. They yeah. messed up my whole pool. Um, Ruth and Kevin brought me a Bucky's bag, which I actually brought home. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe, like, if you carry a Bucky's thing on a plane, people just smile. It brings happiness everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a little stuffed Bucky on my carry-on. And, and people will go, mm-hmm, Bucky's. They, just, they don't even say hi. They just go, Bucky's. It, it doesn't matter if you're a famous person or not. You get a smile at everybody. Um, Austin and Rowan brought some more hair. But, oh, those guys, Ruth and Kevin, brought more fancy bears. Mm-hmm. I'll give them to my mom. Yep. She don't know the difference. You don't like them? I, no, I, I'm just, no. I mean, just being honest. Mm-hmm. There's something weird. I know they're fancy. I think some airline gives those out. I'm thinking of those fake ones, Delta, American, Santa or is it Marco. Delta? I don't Santa know. Well, shout out to Delta. All the flights were great this weekend. Um, and then Austin and Rowan made me my little hair boob. Um, oh, how fun! Pencil holder, and brought the pencils, cool. which I'm fresh out of, which is all I can write in. Uh, that's what I write in my road book. Um, Temple brought some Guinness Blonde. Diane. Um, she has toffee, which I'm sending to my mom. I can't eat it. Uh, Too many implants. Can't risk it. No. Yeah. <laughs> but my mom will review it. I'll have my mom review yeah, yeah, exactly. it. <laughs> that lady started her own candy company. It's like a Hallmark movie. Who does that? Cool. <laughs> All right. This is a, this is a side story and I haven't even taken any cold medicine and I hope he won't, he won't get mad that I said this. One time, when it, when it said uh, candy company, it, I always think of this story. So Ron White, one of his sisters, one Christmas, he gave him some cash because uh-huh. he was like the blue collar thing was exploding, and he gave him some cash. And the one sister um, was really upset because she thought that he was going to buy her a toy store. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> she was like, You've known forever that I want a toy store somewhere in Colorado. Like, and he was like, no, I was not aware that you wanted to have a toy store, nor would I have bought you a toy store. But it's just such a crazy thing for somebody to go, you knew this about me. A toy store. It's so throwback. Uh, Colleen uh, got me the Termite Drive street sign. Uh, that is also being shipped. There's a lot of things being shipped. I think the people backstage are sick of my ass. 
because I'm like, hey, do you mind mailing all this back? And then there's just a table full of stuff. <laughs> um, nice. Karen brought some Bigfoot play cards, Bloody Mary mix, which was wonderful. Uh, team at Really Good Box Wine sent some red box wine, and Melissa invited me to her son's new brewery in Petoskey, Michigan, which I love. Cool. I love Petoskey, and they have a wonderful boat show, and that's where I saw the boat that I bought. Oh, cool. Yeah, I saw it there. And then what's crazy is down, mine was up on land where the cheaper boats are. <laughs> and then I went down, and there were boats down there that were priced at like $1 million, uh-huh. but they put the price up. I thought that was... I'm like, what? if it's over a million, you don't need a sign. One million point two nine eight four seven and seventy seven cents, and then the next one will be like two million. I'd never seen people put a price tag over a million dollars just right there. Yep. That's the price, like a car. Like here's your sticker price. price One million. <laughs> anyway, and then DC because we got to talk about. Well, I got to go to the old Ebert Grill. If you ever go to DC, it's my favorite restaurant there. Get the oysters, sit at the bar. The places, but then across the street is the Hamilton, which is really good, too. And that place goes way, way deep back. You, you can't believe what's in that place. Um, but yeah. more importantly, I got to go to the zoo cool. and see the pandas. We're going to learn a little something about the pandas, termites. Cool. We have, um, yeah, because they're leaving. We heard that on the podcast. I know. They're leaving, and it's very sad. There will only be pandas left in Atlanta. What? That's it. Well, I'm going to get to that, but first we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, both crowds though were just insanely good, and I had taken some cold medicine, and I thought this can be difficult, um, and it wasn't because sometimes the crowd just makes it easy. Yeah. Like, yeah, it just that's great. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, just raced right through. I mean, not in race right through it. We did the real show, mm-hmm. um, but you know, so thank you to everybody that came out. And then this week, heading on down to Fort Worth. It's supposed to rain now, and I want to go see the. I want to go see the. Um, the cattle thing, when they bring the cattle drive in at 11.30 every whatever, I don't know how many days a week they do it, but I want to go to that, but I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, I don't know if they do it when it rains. Anybody? Termites? Do you know? I love seeing the longhorns. They're fascinating. Um, all right, let's start with some queen news. Queen news. Shares. First holiday album, Christmas, has arrived. <laughs> it features 13 songs, including her take on holiday classics like Santa Baby. Can't I do not like that song. I hate it. It's creepy. Yeah. It reminds me of like the 20s or something, all that weird music back then. Like and it. Run Run Rudolph, I don't really love that one either. No. But if Cher sings them, they'll be fine. Yeah. Um, there's four original tunes. <laughs> She said, I never say this about my own records, but I'm really proud of this one. It's one of the most amazing highlights of my career. I remember my dad used to judge people on, he'd go, well, do they have a Christmas album? (laughs) No, dad, Metallica has not released a Christmas album yet, Um, but I'll certainly try to email their people and see if they can do that. That was always the judge. You hadn't made it till you had a Christmas album. She's also recruited special guests for the record, including Darlene Love, who joins her for Christmas, Baby Please Come Home. A 17-year-old Cher actually sang background on Love's original, which she recorded with Phil Spector. Wow. Stevie Wonder also joins her. How old is Stevie Wonder? A million. C- can you giggle that? <laughs> the, the duet of What Christmas Means to Me. I don't know that song either. Um, 73. He's 73? Mm-hmm. That's all? Yeah. Huh. Smokey Robinson's 83. Smokey Robinson is 83. He hey, still Cher. looks great, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, other guests include Cindy Lauper, yay, Michael Bublé, yay, cool. and Tyga, 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 T Y G A, Tyga. Isn't Tyga the rap person? Tyga is a rap person. Tiga. Tiga. Yep. I thought it was supposed, supposed to be Tyga, like, no. isn't it? I'm a Tyga. Well, maybe. He's 33. He's 33. Here's the track list DJ, play a Christmas song, What Christmas Means to Me, Run Run Rudolph, Baby, Please Come Home, Angels in the Snow, Home. Drop top sleigh ride. Please come home for Christmas. I like Christmas. Christmas ain't Christmas without you. Santa baby, put a lot of holiday in your heart with Cindy Lauper. Nice. So there you go. Termites, go get your share. You can download it right now. And in other things you might want to download, Dolly Parton has released Wrecking Ball with her godchild, Miley Cyrus. So great. It's just so great to hear the first part where she's like, uh, uh, how's it, the first part go? Uh, 
Don't you ever say, I just went away. I will always love you. And then you just wait for it to go, la, 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 la. And <clears throat> in other Queen news, Tay-Tay, once again, is Chiefs at fan. the Chiefs game. Yeah. She's at his house. He has upgraded his house from $1 to $6 million house yeah. in a matter of weeks. I'm sure he was, what, if he even knows what her house looks like, he's probably like, I got to clean this shitty little apartment. <laughs> even though it's a $1 million house, she was probably like, oh, this is cute. This is so cute. <laughs> But, I mean, I don't know how long he planned on buying that $6 million house, but <clears throat> I certainly hope it's not for love because uh, it's going to be super weird if you're stuck with it and she bebops off to the rest of the globe and never comes home. He's going with her. Haven't you heard? No, he can't go He's with her till after the Super Bowl. He no. can't go anywhere. He's going to South America. The Chiefs won't allow it. Mm -mm. He's going to Andy Reid will take his fat ass and stand behind the car. You can't leave. He can't leave. No, so she was at the game, and she's doing all these little things with Brittany Mahomes, and their dad was in the box. I think Mama went to Philly. I think she's had enough of the cray-cray for a moment. I mean, not it's not Taylor's fault. She's just crazy. Yeah. It's an insane thing. I've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. Not, not even maybe Michael Jackson. I keep trying to think who. Yeah. I know they say the Beatles. I don't know. For once, I'm too young to know, but. Really? I mean, just a, an individual. Yeah. yeah. Can't no, and the Chiefs won. Right. So, and he really caught a lot of passes. Yeah. I'm sure he was like, yeah, yeah I look great today. I look, <laughs> I look phenomenal. And then the one time I thought he caught it, but it was the other tight end, and the, that guy dropped it. And I'm like, oh, Tay Tay, don't forget the words of her songs. You can't be dropping balls. It was the other guy. It wasn't even. Him. I'm sitting there causing shit, and it's not even happening. That's what my fantasy team was so awful. Yeah. I'm requiring them to all go on steroids immediately. <laughs> immediately. Everyone, anyone on my team has to take steroids. I don't even care if you're the kicker. <laughs> Steroid up. Why this not? is getting critical. <laughs> so the pandas at the, at the uh, zoo, I never knew any of this. Yeah. Everybody always wants to shit talk Richard Nixon. Nobody ever gives Richard credit. He's the one who got the pandas here to the United States in 1972. What? It's called panda diplomacy. Stop it. <laughs> I'm serious. The National Zoo's three giant pandas, and I read how to pronounce them, but I don't remember. It was on the sign. Mi Zhang, Sing Sing, and their cub, Z Qi Ji. They're set to return to early China <laughs> in December with no public signs that the 50-year-old exchange agreement struck by Richard Nixon will continue. We, I don't think they're going to let us have them anymore. I don't either. But that, I saw the one was out. I only saw one. And you forget how big they are. They are when it starts walking, like it sits there, it looks like a giant stuffed animal. Then when it walks, you're like, oh, right, it's a bear. I mean, you, he's got the little rounded ears. He's too cute. They're, they're, they can be really violent. They don't even let the zoo people in there with them, ever. Nope. They're deceiving, though. National zoo, National zoo officials have remained tight-lipped about the prospects of renewing or extending the agreement, and repeated attempts to gain comment on the state of the negotiation did not re receive a response. However, the public stance of the zoo has been decidedly pessimistic, treating these remaining months as the end of an era. Yeah, the potential end of the National Zoo's uh, b b diplomatic tensions running high between Beijing and a number of Western government. China appears to be gradually pulling its pandas back from multiple Western zoos. So there were one or two in Memphis. They got sent back. Atlanta still has them. They're going to have them the longest. If you want to go see them, these guys in D.C. are going back in early December. Okay. Atlanta sometimes in 2024. Gonna go see them when you play I'm going to go in Atlanta. I usually go to the aquarium in Atlanta because it's a wonderful aquarium. The D.C. Zoo was pretty good, but for the National Zoo, I got to say, I expect a little bit more. Yeah. And then some of it, I just think, I don't, should we do this anymore? Like, I, I don't want to get into the argument. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny joke about it, though. Because okay. Ron, one time, my friend Ron, the comedian, one of his wives, I won't say which one, <laughs> said he wanted to take his mother to the zoo mm -hmm. because she wanted to go to the zoo. Mm -hmm. And mother gets whatever mo mother wants when you're a Southern man. Mm -hmm. If mother wants it, we're doing it. Well, she got mad because she's anti-zoo. And she said, zoos are like prison cells for animals. Jail cells for animals. 
And Ron goes, well, that is utter bullshit because I have been to jail and nobody decorated my cell to make it look like my apartment. Nobody gave me a mate to mate with because I was bored and we needed tiny Ron Whites. <laughs> I've been to jail. It's not as good as a zoo. So anyway, I don't want to get in that argument, and I won't respond to anything regarding whether zoos are good or bad. I don't know. Right now, I know they're still here, and I wanted to see a panda bear. Yep, and you got and, to. And I got to. Um, Beijing currently lends out 65 pandas to 19 countries through cooperative research programs and with a stated mission to better protect the vulnerable species. The pandas return to China when they reach old age, and the cubs are born or sent to China around age three or four. Oh... The San Diego Zoo returned its pandas in 2019, and the last bear at the Memphis Zoo went home earlier this year. Probably a little too hot in Memphis. Yeah. 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 They got a giant fur coat on. <laughs> the departure of the National Zoo is me. The only giant pandas left are at the Atlanta Zoo, and that uh, agreement expires late next year. The Chinese could possibly be just sending us a signal. Oh, don't be so juvenile. <laughs> Uh, if you're not giving me nice hands, I'm going to take my panda back. Um, yeah, so, but here's the one. This is how it started. It's kind of crazy. Um, that's too much. That's too many hard things in that article. Uh, the first ones were Ling Ling and Sing Sing. They were here from 1969 to 1972. Like oh, no, that's when they were born. Like the present. They were given to us as a gift. Um, following Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972. It seem like a gift with a timeline. Well, is it a gift if it has a timeline? No. no. It's a lease. It's a lease. It's a loan. <laughs> You've loaned you pandas, and then they switch them out. They were the first one, though, Ling Ling and Sing Sing. Um, they were captured in the wild. Oh. oh. That's not good. No. No. Uh First Lady Pat Nixon mentioned her fondness for the species, with to which the Chinese premier Zhu and Lai said, oh, I'll give you some. Wow, that's all Pat Nixon had to do was drop that at dinner. Love a panda. Great. Send me one. No problem. They had five cubs, the pair, between 1983 and 1989, but none of them survived past a few days. If you watch panda uh, videos on Instagram, they're not the brightest of the bears. No, Fun, they're really funny, but it's usually from little disasters. Um, Ling Ling died from heart failure in 1992. She was the longest living giant panda outside of China. Um, oh, and, and Sing Sing lived to age 28, died of kid, kidney failure. So now you know, if you want to go see them, for them, yeah, yeah, yeah it is Sorry. old. Also, they do they do a lot of dang. They're very clumsy. Like the Instagram videos are funny because they're just constantly like, they're strong though. Because the, the one that was sitting out broke a bamboo branch, but like just went, mm -hmm. and it was this giant thing. I'm like, oh shit, right? You forget they're actually Bears. a bear, right? Um, all right, moving on to update, update, update. I only have a couple updates. I don't know why. Some weeks not a lot. Banksy, the artist, mm -hmm. he's in Gaza. Yeah, he's in Gaza, Palestine. And he painted the cutest thing I've ever seen. It's a kitten with a red bow on its neck. What? It's a giant kitten. I mean, it's an enormous painting. But we're going to get to something else about Banksy in a second. Okay. In the rubble-strewn streets of Gaza, an uninfected figure emerges, a playful kitten adorned with a sassy red bow. This gem, this street art gem is none other than then Banksy's signature touch, adding a splash of amusement to a landscape of devastation. Banksy's kitten, with its wildfire, uh, wide-eyed curiosity, feels like a tongue-in-cheek nod to the resilience amidst chaos. It's as if the kitten is saying, I've got nine lives, and not even rubble can phase me. Yet the ruins tell a deeper, sadder tale of his city, bearing the scars of conflict. I don't know, maybe he just like cats. You know, people, I saw there were cats in Gaza. They, mm -hmm. they were like, just be glad your cat isn't in Gaza. It was sad. Oh. Yeah, it was on Instagram, whatever, or TikTok. I don't know. But um, maybe he just likes cats. People read a lot of shit into this stuff that you don't know that's what he was thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe he just thought a kitten would cheer people up. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of Banksy things over there, though, 
and a lot of a couple of them. Um, there's kids on a swing set, like one of those swings where you the whole thing swings, a ride. Like, um, so now here's the thing: is that really Banksy, or are there a bunch of Banksies? Well, um, uh, yeah, he did like six of them. How does he? How's he doing these in Gaza with missiles being fired and? Well, here's the thing. We might find out who Banksy is, and I hope we don't ever find out. But an upcoming defamation case could finally unmask the famous street art street uh, famous street artist Banksy. The graffiti artist known as Banksy might be unmasked in an upcoming pop in an upcoming defamation case over his use of Instagram to invite shoplifters to a guest store because it had used his imagery without permission. I remember that we yeah. talked about that. Yeah. yeah. Now, see, though, if he's going to start suing people, you're going to have to say who you are. And it's a matter of public record. (laughs) Well, I don't know about in England, but here it would be. The case is seen as an attempt to force Banksy to relinquish his anonymity, which many say has been important to his success over the years. The speculation that he's believed to be by many, uh, Bristol's Robin Guggingham. Now the uh, the bookies are taking bets in England. Yeah. There's some other people in the running. But I've always thought it was this guy. He's named as the co-defendant in the defamation suit. Well, it's not been confirmed that Banksy is Gunningham, pointing this is no way, this is in no way a revelation. Moreover, trying to find out his identity ultimately does not matter. No, it should stay a mystery. That's why it's fun. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, don't steal it. <clears throat> Nobody's able to absolutely link Gunningham and Banksy. Short of his admission, complete certainty is unlikely, but if Banksy's identity is revealed, police forces around the world would bring vandalism, property destruction, criminal mischief, or worse charges against the individual. It's another reason to hide. Right. Right? <clears throat> if he revealed himself, it would destroy the banks, Banksy mystique. He is not likely to snitch on himself or damage the brand. Yeah, may, but then people are saying maybe it's a collective. They said at one time there was one Banksy who had a graffiti career and a famous beef in the subculture with London graffiti legend Robbo. Robo? Robo. That time is gone. Banksy is now a collective of artists who work together to pr- produce thoughtful, provocative, and subverse pieces and installations. I think it's a bunch of people. Because once you know what he does, or he sends you the things and says you go out and paint them. Right. Yeah. True. The ideas. Um, I don't know. We one. might find out, though. That's about, so I don't know when this is coming to fake. Banksy fakes are everywhere. You could also do the fakes, but I don't know. Is, how, do, how would he have gotten into Gaza? True. You know, I don't think you can just wander in there right now. Or <laughs> would you want to? With buckets of paint. Right. I don't know. Those are my only updates. Isn't that sad? No, it's okay. I don't know. Yeah, nothing really. A lot of queen news. A lot of queen news, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't get to watch or anything, so I don't have What Are We Watching? And the podcast um, I listened to in the car was Murder Murder Apartment 12. Yeah, I think I already said that, though. Sorry, Torres. It's still taking a little cold medicine. Holy shit, they found it. Yeah, this, this is really cool. All the world may be a stage, as Shakespeare once famously said. But a recent discovery may have yielded the most famous stage yet. Literal theater floorboards dating back to the Elizabethan age, which are believed to have been trod on by none other than the bard Shakespeare himself. No! Yeah, the discovery was made at St. George Guildhall in Norfolk during a renovation. The 600-year-old planks were located underneath ones put down in the 50s. And another layer believed to have been laid laid in the 18th or 19th century. They're 12 inches in width, 6 inches thick, and held together in lieu of nails with wooden pegs. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. Experts are now confidently saying these are the floorboards Shakespeare Shakespeare would have trodden. Who uses that word? (laughs) Trodden. (laughs) Trodden. (laughs) They told the paper, it makes this building important nationally and internationally. When the building began... Life is a religious meeting house, as confirmed by a royal charter in 1406. (laughs) It hosted its first theatrical performance in 1445. Several pieces of evidence suggest that the bard himself performed at the venue. But we don't even know who Shakespeare is. 
They've never identified that guy. There's like, I don't know, five guys in the running. <laughs> <laughs> London theaters were closed due to an outbreak of the plague from, 19, from 1592 to 9, 1593. Records indicate that Shakespeare's company was on tour in King's Lynn. An account book shows that his company was paid to perform there. Cool. Wow. You could really sell some tickets now. I wonder who, I wonder why they even dug that deep. <laughs> Um, we could date the floor by construction type. These boards are pegged to secure them, which is a medieval technique. We also had some sampling dung, which provided us with a tree ring date and the growth rings in the timber at, in the timber. And it's an early 15th century floor. Awesome. That's really super cool. You should yeah. see the theater. It's got like, um, the be the, the beams above the thing. And mm -hmm. it, it's a very deep theater. There's let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, like, Ten seats in a row, mm -hmm. but it goes deep. Cool. They don't say how many it seats. Maybe I'll do a show there. Somebody <laughs> find out how many seats. What's the ticket price? Thank you. <laughs> oh, maybe the British comics could go. Uh, holy shit, they found it. A pair of 9,500-year-old sandals discovered in a Spanish bat cave. They are officially Europe's oldest shoes. Gross. And let me tell you what. Looking at them... You might have been more comfortable without them. <laughs> I I don't I don't know. These look awful. Like picture walking on old timey boat ropes. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. My friend Andrew's always barefoot. Just get your feet hard. Like his feet, his feet are basically shoes. Get yeah. Um. Uh, the cave of bats. It's no. It, it was first discovered in uh, 1857. The actual mm -hmm. cave by miners who stumbled upon. A group of mummified corpses. Years later, archaeologists determined it was a hunter-gatherer berry site based on blah, blah, blah. Now archaeologists have used the latest dating technology to show the cave's items are the oldest evidence of sophisticated basketry ever found in Southern Europe. This includes the sandals. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. You can go on. We'll put it in the notes. You can look at a pair and decide if you want them. That's awesome. I would say some flip-flops online would be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> They were woven out of esparto, a type of grass, native. It doesn't look like grass. They uh, they made twine by crushing the esparto, then dried it for 30 days, then soaking it for 24 hours so that the grass was pliable, a traditional technique, the article notes, that endures to this day. There you go. You can go look at them. Cool. Yeah. No, thanks. I think okay. I'd rather just go on. Um, we're gonna, yeah. All right. That's a hard one. Um, I'm looking for... Oh, this is very exciting. All right. This is a big point of argument. Okay. Yes, and I I know people on both sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. I don't ha have a side yet because I have never played pickleball. I want to. And the golf course up the, by my house put it... They made brand new pickle... Pickleball courts. My friend Nicole plays all the time. Um, well, people are getting really pissed off about it. I guess it's loud. I, why is it more loud? I don't understand. Is tennis more muted? Yeah. It's lowering people's home values. It's, it's a hard ball. It's a hard ball. <laughs> versus tennis, the, that doesn't bother anybody? No. I don't know about that. This is well, and they say those pe pickleball. the pickleball people show up like at 6 a.m. and it goes till like dark. Stop. Yeah. Ugh. Well, I wouldn't want to live right next door to one from everything I've read. I won't meet you at 6 a.m. No, 6 a.m. You got to beat the old people. Not true. We'll have to get the up super up. seniors. We'll have, we'll have to get up at four. Right. They won't come like about 4.30. That's their dinner time. Yeah. We'll go up 4.30. Perfect. There's a sour <laughs> side to pickleball. Oh, you know somebody waited all week to write that uh -huh. sentence. The game's rapid rise between 2020 and 2022. It saw a 113 increase in 113 percent increase in participation. Okay, are you any of you termites out there pickleballing? Um, Lots of people like it. it is made for ugly turf wars, furious noise complaints, violence, <laughs> lawsuits. <laughs> And even potential criminal charges. Now, I did see a thing on like, I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or something. 
where these people were like, we can't stand it. We're going insane in our own house because right. theirs happens to be. And then I did hear, but I don't know. I don't It's weird hearing on a TV. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I've had to go over our recreational sports center and t- tell 70-year-old men, if you threaten to hit our sports center director with the paddle again, I'm going to kick you out. Stop. These are old people. That's in Glendale, Colorado. Oh. He never anticipated his job might include lecturing senior citizens on how to play nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing has been off limits since the, the picklers, short for pickleball players, began showing up in earnest in the Denver Enclave. A couple months ago, a group of fierce competitors all over the age of 60 refused to leave the city's outdoor tennis courts when asked by maintenance staff. Oh my God. The courts were scheduled to be resurfaced. resurfaced. But the players stood their ground and yelled, you can't make us, until oh. the cops arrived. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know why I think this is so funny. <laughs> In September, the Glendale City Council ended up passing a first of its kind, according to USA Pickleball's Managing Director of Facilities Development and Equipment Standards, Carl Schmidt's ordinance, after community tennis players grumbled that picklers had taken over the courts from dawn to dark. It is now a misdemeanor for people to bring pickleball nets onto the tennis courts <laughs> to draw pickleball lines on them, shovel snow off them, or place chairs on their surfaces. Cameras will be trained <laughs> on the repaired tennis courts to catch violators who would face up to a $1,000 fine. Well, it seems like it'll be worth it to these people. If there's four of them, let's divide it. So right, the 250 bucks a pop. It's the scarcity with pickleball venues side so and so people feel like never feel like there's a lack of basketball courts. Nope. Nobody plays basketball. I don't know. I never look never look for one of those either. No. In New York City, picklers have tussled with parents after setting up courts in children's play areas. Stop it. <laughs> in the West Village. Um, but mostly it's tennis players who are having their territory encroached upon. Oh. Roughly thirty five percent of the nearly 45,000 pickleball courts in the United States and Canada were converted from tennis courts, leading some to cry foul. There's so many sports little analogies you could weave into this story. Mm-hmm. Oh, Martina's weighing in. If pickleball is that popular, let them build their own courts, said Martina Navratilova. She wrote that on Twitter last year. Oh my gosh, she would just dominate at pickleball. Yeah. That yeah. left hand, I would run away. I wouldn't even go out there with her. I, no way, no way, no. I don't want to get injured. No. The United States Tennis Association maintains that the sport of kings is booming and the number of people playing tennis is more combined than the number of people playing pickleball, badminton, racquetball, and squash. First of all, I do not believe that. I don't either. I think the United States Tennis Association is making that shit up mm-hmm. because nobody... They want to be they want it to be a thing. You had your heyday in the 70s with McEnroe and Chrissy Everett. And yeah, it's still a thing. But I mean, let's go through the names of who's playing when you're watching Wimbledon. Well, I should ask my friend Lorene because she, she actually subscribes to the tennis channel. What? She, well, she loves tennis. She played in college. Um, I didn't know she, she was a tennis. Yeah. Yes. Um, wow. She was very good. Um, but every subdivision I've seen in... Missouri or Tennessee, I'm seeing pickleball people, yeah. and I'm not seeing tennis people. Nope. And then the old people quit tennis eventually because eventually they fall down and get hurt. I mean, come on. Everybody knows that. I, And also, Tennis Association, you can't throw badminton in there. Badminton is what you play at a family picnic. It's not something you structure. <laughs> I've been alive a long time. I've never had a friend go, do you want to go play badminton later? No. I mean, if we're drunk, we'll do it in my cousin's backyard. <laughs> racquetball, that stopped with Woody Allen. Nobody's playing racquetball anymore. No. It was a thing. Elvis still, if you go to Graceland, he still had a racquetball court because it was popular then. Right. Squash? I don't even know how you play. I don't know the sport. Termites? No. There's wine, isn't there? No, that's racquetball. I don't know. I didn't really know how to play racquetball. I have played it back when I was like 12. But it was, I don't think I knew the rules. It was just, well, as a kid, it was fun to just bash a, a rubber ball and, and then it bounced off all the walls, and it was violent. I like that. <laughs> a 2023 National Tennis Participation Report found that nearly 24 million people played at least once in 2022. Where's all this happening? That's a lot of rounding. Yeah. 
Um, Pickleball, a different report said, is the fastest growing sport in America. Participation doubled in 2022, increasing by 85% year over year and by an astonishing 158% over three years. By comparison, the tennis participation only increased about 4% in 2022. Um, and, <laughs> and this is guy's a salesman. He sells pickleball. He knows how to make the pickleball course. In the last three years, every phone call I get is, I want to convert my tennis court into a pickleball. Or am I, I'm looking at putting in new pickleball courts in my location. He, uh, a pickler himself, he anticipates the courts eventually becoming as ever-present in certain communities as backyard, uh, as backyard pools. In March, the Associated Pickleball Professionals reported that 48 million adults had played pickleball at least once in the past year. It was originally viewed as a game among seniors, but as we've talked about on this uh, podcast, mm -hmm. Tom Brady owns a team now. Right. And then I watched this whole special about the a mom and a daughter, yes. and they're making bazillions of dollars in sponsorship. Yep. Um, I'm going to get my mom out there for the over <laughs> 80s. <laughs> Put her good knee. Um, the average player is now 35 years old. But pickleball causes more of a racket than other racket sports. Uh, the hard paddle and perforate, perf, per, I can't say it, perforated plastic ball used to play the game make for louder impulsive noises, as acoustic engineers call them, which can travel over longer distances than noises from tennis balls and rackets. Dozens of lawsuits have been filed. Now, it, let's say your subdivision did that mm -hmm. and your house is right next to that. Yeah. If I went house shopping... And I saw that, I'd be like, oh, no, fuck no. I can't live next to it. Yeah. It's like yeah. a harder noise, ping. though. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a hard ping. Um, yeah, like giant ping pong balls. Uh -huh. Dozens of love of the bump. A noise concern. On Cape Cod. <laughs> shout out to my sister-in-law, Amy. Um, an injunction barring pickleball is placed at certain outdoor cards, it, of course, in the town of Falmouth, Massachusetts, because of noise complaints. Dustin Fouth, who lives with his wife and two and two children, a couple hundred feet from the pickleball court, said in an affidavit that the constant pop, pop, pop of the game comes through the windows and walls of his home, forcing his family to play loud music, wear noise-canceling headphones, close windows, or leave home to go elsewhere. We just can't take it anymore. Wow. It's driving people slowly crazy. <laughs> Fallmouth officials have tackled ongoing pickle concerns at their meetings for years, and despite the injunction that was placed over the summer, Pickleball players, some say primarily from out of town, still riled up neighbors and concerned town officials by climbing the fence. Stop it. Make it electric. Lance Willis, principal acoustic engineer for such and such, which handles noise studies, used to do two or three jobs a year, primarily around Arizona at 55 and older communities. Now he typically has had four or five pickleball-related jobs at one time, and they're across the United States in places such as Minnesota, Vermont, Massachusetts, as well as Canada. I've been involved in several legal actions. Of course. I don't know. Um, wow. In March, the city put a six-month moratorium on constructing new outdoor pickleball courts. In San Francisco, socialite Holly Peterson, <laughs> who's married to Hotwire.com founder Carl Peterson, headed up a campaign in August petitioning the city to immediately shut down the courts in her upscale neighborhood. <laughs> As a Presidio Heights residence, the relentless pickleball games <laughs> on Presidio wall courts are damaging to our peace and quiet. <laughs> The noise just isn't grating. It's altering our way of life and the wildlife of our cherished Presidio. So is hot. Presidio. Presidio. I've been saying that wrong. <laughs> she wrote, the endless racket threatens our fragile ecosystem. It sounds like a fr fragile, your, your e fragile nerves, exactly. not the <laughs> ecosystem. This isn't just about us. It's about preserving nature for future generations. Beyond that, home values within 500-foot radius are sinking, deterred by the unyielding noise. Wow. This just isn't, isn't just a hit to homeowners. It's a blow to our local economy. She'd been trying to sell their $36 million mansion, which, <laughs> <laughs> which features a karaoke room that opens onto its own pickleball court. Oh, my God. You don't care about the economy. You are the economy. You, yeah, you are the economy. I'm surprised you even let cars go up there. How are these people getting up there? Uh, on a scooter. One real estate agent said, I've been selling real estate for over a decade. Never had anybody ask me about tennis, but I've had people ask me about pickleball, so that's got to say something. I'm going to ask my friend Nicole, because there's one in her neighborhood. Oh. I don't know how close it is to their house, because I haven't had time to go over um, where her and Mark live, but I'm, I'm going to find out if all this is a thing. Do you have $50 million? Not yet. Whoops. 
Nope, I don't. But there's a 17 carat blue royal fancy vivid blue diamond, and they think that's what it's going to sell for. No, it's at the, at the, at the always popular fall Geneva jewelry auctions. Uh, I like how they write that, like always popular. Right. Like who the hell knows? Mm-hmm. No, no, no normal person would know that. Everyone knows. It's a 17.61 carat. It's the largest internationally flawless fancy vivid blue gem to ever appear at auction, Christie said in a statement. Very lovely. But Christie seems to say that about every diamond that comes up, That's that it's true. flawless. Mm-hmm. It's going to... It's going to go, oh, it's at the Four Seasons um, Hotel. It would be, uh, its estimate is 35 to 50 million. If the stone achieves it, it would be among the top five fancy blue diamonds ever sold at auction. Yes, I will keep you updated on how much it goes for. I am curious. People with so much money, like, it just, I don't even want it. I just am curious as to what people spend their money on. Mm -hmm. Crazy. This thing's beautiful, but what are you going to do? You can't wear it out. Someone will murder you. I mean, yeah, you can't, you have to, you'd have like, you have to have 20 bodyguards to go, hey, I'm wearing that necklace tonight. Can you tell Joe and Bob and Steve and whomever? This is a weird thing going up for auction. And then I think, huh, why don't they act like a normal family? Queen Elizabeth's $110,000 mile, 110,000 mile Range Rover's heading to auction. A Range Rover. Didn't the grandkid call that? I mean, that's how it works everywhere. everywhere. Like if, you know, if grandpa dies, I call his truck. Like somebody, isn't there, doesn't anybody want the truck? It's hers. It's it's the one that she always saw her in. Yeah, I have no allegiance towards the queen, but I don't understand. A third generation Land Rover with a unique history is now up for auction. How heartless are these people? Well. I would keep it. Let's get into Ireland. Well, (laughs) It's the one you always saw her in in the videos when she had her little scarf on and she's tooling around Scotland or whatever, whatever part of the world she owns uh-huh. that particular day. <laughs> the 2004 Land Rovers feature some distinct modifications you wouldn't usually find in products. The rear door windows each have two switches so that one person in the back can operate both without leaning to the other side. It also has grab handles for the rear seat passengers that work with the side steps to assist with entry and exit. <laughs> It's an Epsom Green Rain Rover, and it has a sand hide interior that the queen protected with front and seat rear covers. Oh, Stop. she's an old lady. Put plastic on stuff. Oh, what? It also has a dog guard separating the passenger compartment with the cargo ha- with a cage. That was for the corgis. She also has a modified front grille with covered lights and mud guards to keep the queen's ride clean. I know. Oh, um, Somebody that I can't believe no grandkid was like, well, fuck, I'll take it. Right. I mean, if nobody wants it, you know, we're going to put it up for auction. What do you need? How much money do you think you're going to get? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, she reigned for 70 years. She was spotted multiple times driving herself, often behind the wheel of a landlord. Although she was spotted in 2021 piloting a green Jaguar wagon around Windsor Castle. Her love of driving resulted in an outpour of condolences from automakers around the world. Yeah. I'll let you know who, pay, who, I just think it's weird you wouldn't keep that in the family. Yeah. Especially how much she drove it. Well, at least the clips I saw. Maybe there were a bunch of Land Rovers. Maybe I don't even know what I'm talking about. David Maybe. Beckham hmm? David Beckham will buy it. David Beckham. One of the Spice Girls. Um, Paul McCartney. So there's a lot of things for auction. Yeah. Do you have 1.2 million? Not yet. Am I getting closer? <laughs> The bottle of the most sought-after Scotch whiskey to come under the hammer at Sotheby's in London next month. Oh, it's the most. Uh, it's a 96-year-old bottle of single malt from the distiller Macallan. The Macallum Atomy, 1926, will come under the hammer. Um, advanced be- bidding begins November 1st. Oh. A version of it was sold in 2019 for one and a half million pounds. A record for any bottle of wine or spirit. But then what do you do? Do you drink it? Well, do you just show it to people? If you're Elon, you drink it. It seems childish. If you're a new millionaire, you're Hey, do you want to see my job? Do you want to see my super bottle of expensive of scotch? And then you just show it. You don't offer it to people? No. You save it for some special <laughs> occasion? I don't, I mean, what? I don't know. Weird. Sotheby says some of the 40 clients were offered to McCall. What? 
Uh, well, anyway, this one's going up for sale. I don't know. That's the question. I would drink it. Yeah, you have to. But, you know, you can't just do that on a Monday. You just watch a Monday Night Football. You gotta, it's got to no. be like a thing. No, that's what um, drink. That's um, <laughs> there's also, um, I already did one. Okay, this is going to be a little bit hard, termite. But we're going to get through it. Let's have a little bit of beer. Let's have a drink. Yeah. Ready? But it's com- this is what it's complete bullshit. I already drank that one. I've moved on. Why? <laughs> and I feel like every year we go through this. Okay. This is why all of us termites are going to settle this right now. Okay. okay. Why does the United States keep daylight savings time? Uh, well, I call it savings. That's what we say in the Midwest. It's daylight saving time. We always said daylight savings time. It's just one in, one saving. One saving. <laughs> Twice a year. I didn't know that. Because I drive to the top of my street in winter, and I see children standing out in the dark, waiting on a school bus, and, and it's also freezing. And I think, and then you wonder why they're angry little bastards and just start <laughs> shooting sh- shit. Because look what you're doing to them. It's freezing. I'm in the car, and I'm whining because yeah. the heat hasn't come on enough. <laughs> It's almost time for clocks to fall back one hour. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're, we're first November, first Saturday oh. November. Oh. So it's in two weeks from whenever you hear this. I don't don't count. You check your local listings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when you listen to this. <laughs> it's time for most clocks to fall back in one hour. <laughs> On the oh. second Sunday of March at two a.m., clocks in most of the United States and other countries move forward one hour and stay there for nearly eight months in what is called daylight saving time. No S, Midwest people. (laughs) On the first Sunday of November at 2 a.m., clocks fall back to an hour to standard time. So we'll gain an hour, right? right? Yeah, spring you lose an hour, spring back, fall forward. Okay, what weekend is that? That's the weekend of my show in St. Louis, so I'll need that extra hour because I'll be in the bar all night. You'll be in the bar Mm -hmm. that extra hour. I wonder how the bars do that. There's always some. It doesn't count. There's always a sign. Right. We're going home you can't go. It's not last call. No. We're changing clocks in an hour. <laughs> the current March to November system that follows the U.S. began in 2007 with the concept of saving daylight. Is but the concept of saving daylight is much older. Daylight daylight saving time has its roots in train schedules. We can decide what time it is. Right. Can we just have a meeting? Right. But how are we going to, we can't even get a speaker of the house. <laughs> Jesus, more or less decide what time it is. Exactly. I did think that, I don't really talk about politics on here because I know everybody gets sick of it. I get sick of it myself. But Jim Jordan became the psycho boyfriend that wouldn't stop texting. Are you sure you, <laughs> are you sure you don't like me? Please, let's vote again. <laughs> Answer me again. Let's vote again. And then every time it got worse. And it's like, finally, as the person that's being stalked by somebody, you're like, look, I was trying to be nice at first. And I said, it's just me. I don't really gel with you. And then the second time, I'm like, look, I, I really don't like you. And now you're forcing me to say, I fucking hate you. Like, what are you not getting? He kept losing votes. It, it, it got worse every time. I don't know who. Not to mention, I just, health-wise, I think Jim Jordan's a strange color. I think he should go to a doctor. There's something wrong with his coloring. Um, let the little guy in the bow tie have it. I don't know. That guy who kept going, we're coming to order. And we're going to have a vote again. Patrick, somebody. Fine. Let him do it. Let's just move on with the country's. He's an Irish red. <laughs> Patrick McHenry. Yes. The bow tie is a little much for me, but it, it's, it works for the purpose of identification. Um, it was train schedules. That's where its roots are. But it was put into practice in Europe and the United States to save fuel and power during World War I. A lot of people said this was all about farming. Yeah. And then I read all this other stuff no. that says no. Fuck coal. That was according to the U.S. Transportation Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Pro tip, it's daylight saving time with the singular use saving, not savings. Thank you, bashing Midwest people. <laughs> My, they might say it everywhere, but that's what I... <laughs> the U.S. kept daylight saving time permanent during most, most of World War II. The idea was put, uh, was put in to conserve fuel and keep things standard. As the war came to a close in 1945, Gallup asked respondents how we should tell time. Only 17% wanted to keep what was called wartime. What? Yeah, I wish my grandparents were still alive. They would know the answer to this. Wartime. 
During the energy crisis of the 70s, we tried permanent daylight saving time again in the winter of 73 to 74. Okay. Really? Did we? When termites? We got any older termites? I wasn't alive. I wasn't either. Certain senior termites? What was that like? The idea was to conserve fuel. It was a popular move when Richard Nixon signed the law in 1974. But by the end of the month, Florida's governor had called for the law's repeal after eight school children were hit by cars in the dark. <laughs> It's, it's not funny that children were hit by cars. But I. it's funny to me that it was eight. Like, the one got hit, nothing. The second one got hit, well, that shouldn't be out there. Schools across the country started delaying start times until the sun came up. Well, they don't do that anymore. I see them standing out there in the dark waiting on the bus. By summer, public approval had plummeted. And in early October, Congress voted to switch back to standard time. In the U.S., states are not required by law to fall back or spring forward. It's not even states. This is why, as a comic, right. uh, Arizona, and for a while, Indiana, they didn't participate either. So you think it's a certain time, and then you arrive in their state, and they're like, joke's on you. We don't play that. What, you guys opted out? You opted? I thought this was a national... States rights. World. States rights. States rights. Um, they're not required to. Hawaii, most of Arizona, and some territories in the Pacific and Caribbean do not observe daylight saving Alaska time. Up too. Alaska, um, the twice yearly switcheroo is irritating enough to lawmakers of all political stripes that the U.S. Senate passed legislation in March of 2022 to make daylight saving time permanent. Now it's only Hawaii and Arizona. Hawaii and Arizona. Mm-hmm. Well, then Arizona and Nevada. There's a the Colorado River is all that stands between them, and I worked at a casino on the Nevada side, and they put us up in a hotel mm-hmm. across the river. It's just across the bridge. In Arizona, mm-hmm. I didn't know what time it was anywhere. I just showed up for like five hours early, and then wow. I would just ask people, do you know what time it is? This is before <laughs> cell phones. Because I was so nervous I was going to miss the show. Right. I'm like, well, I'm going now. Yeah. And the other comic would be like, Kathleen, it's noon. I know, but it could be 4 o'clock over there. I don't fucking know what time it is. No one knows what time it is. It was the most confusing week of my life. Okay. Well, the U.S. Senate passed legislation in March of 2022 to make daylight saving time permanent. The bill passed by unanimous consent. It would need to pass the House of Representatives and be signed by Joe Biden to become law. Well, let's get on it, Joe. Let's get on it. Yeah, he's busy, but this is a side thing you could do on a plane. I do bullshit. <laughs> I do bullshit work on planes. Bullshit work. Give me bullshit. This is a softball. This is easy, easy, easy. <laughs> House lawmakers failed to vote on the bill in 2022. Probably because we, we can't get people as speakers that we don't fire or no. have to tell them 18 times we hate your guts, go away. <laughs> However, on March 2nd, a dozen senators forming a bipartisan group introduced legislation that would end clock switching in favor of da- permanent daylight saving time. Um, this was introduced by Rep- Representative Vern Buchanan, a Republican from Florida in the House. Good job, Vern. Why do we need it? Studies say that over what daylight saving time over the last 25 years, have shown that the one-hour change disrupts body rhythms tuned to Earth's rotation, adding fuel to the debate over whether it's a good idea in any form. The issue for every argument is the counter-argument. There are studies that say we have more car accidents when people lose an extra hour of sleep. We're not going to lose an extra hour if you make it permanent. That's just called life then, exactly. right? right? What am I missing here? Well, yeah. Oh, there are studies that show robberies decline when there's an extra hour of sunlight at the day. <laughs> Great. <laughs> We also know that people suffer more heart attacks at the start of daylight saving time. But what about our mental health? Yes, people are happier when there's an extra hour of light. Why is that so difficult to comprehend? That's why they have indoor light things for people who live in dark places. They're called happy lights. I bought one for my mom. Happy lights? Yeah. What's a happy light? Well, I don't know. She's my mom's half banana sometimes. And she's like, it's just been so dark and depressing here, and I think I need more light. So I found this thing online. It's called happy light. You just stare at it. Yeah, it looks like one of those mirrors oh, that I would have had like in high school. Yeah. It's just a light, but it's intense light. Okay. She says it works. Right. Um, <laughs> instead, the lobbying effort for daylight saving came, came mostly from different sectors of the country. We don't need to go into all this, but here's the thing. Um, the bottom line, it's not clear whether having an extra of sunlight at the end of the day versus the beginning is helpful. It just depends on who you are and what you want. And it doesn't look like daylight saving time is going away in the U.S. anytime soon. Right. It 
gets light out right now about 6.45 a.m., which yeah. is fine. Yeah, I'm surprised you know that. Because of the cats. I know that because of the cats. Oh. Because they know if I'm, they don't like it if I leave in the dark. What? No, they don't. They get very upset. A lot of talking if it's in dark because then they know I'm leaving, leaving. If it's midday, they don't know if I'm just going out. Wow, I think you made that up. I did not make that up. <laughs> no, I have to hide my suitcase and everything. Oh, they all know. They all know. Wow. Um, <laughs> but so, okay, so it gets dark about it, 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 6.45, sun comes up, 6.45, sun goes up. Perfect. Let's just call that the time. Let's just make that the time. That's light enough till 7 o'clock at night. American time. Mm-hmm. Well, clearly we can do whatever the hell we want and make everybody do it. It's very difficult as a comedian to be flying to different, first of all, I'm in different time zones and then you're not playing. You just opted out of the time game. You're not participating in time. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how that was allowed. (laughs) Spirit Airlines. Dirty birds. I recommend don't fly on Spirit. (laughs) Uh, I'm not a transportation expert. I'm just saying I see... The crowd gathered, checking in at Spirit. It could get weird. It's sort of <laughs> like a carnival cruise ship, um, meaning. But I get why. The tickets are cheap, so you get a lot of young people, a lot of party people, whatever. But all you got to do is look at the plane. Look at that bright yellow. Tell me that wasn't a paint color that was on sale. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's oh, my God, too much. Anyway, they were ordered to pay $8.25 million in, to customers um, hit with surprise bag fees at the airport. Oh. This is where they're dirty birds. Yeah, they tell you the ticket's only $69, and then you get there, and every single thing you're holding costs more money. They had to pay back the customers who were hit with the surprise baggage fees. The settlement is a culmination of a six-year class action lawsuit against a company. Impacted passengers booked their flights on third-party site, sites and did not expect to pay for bags. Well... The third party flight f- site should have said that. Right. But I could also see if you don't go to the actual website. Can you buy spirit on a third party? Can you buy spirit? I don't know. I don't use those anymore, like Travelocity <laughs> or whatever. No, I just go straight to the website. I don't. Oh, you can. I, kayak. Kayak? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They booked third-party sites like Expedia, and they were charged additional fees for carry-on at the airport per the suit. Uh, Spirit baggage guidelines. Only uh, only a small personal item that fits under the seat is included in the ticket price. So if you have a wheelie bag that's going to go up top, you're paying for that. A carry-on price changes depending on when and where you travel. But at the gate can run passengers from $99 up. If you see my act lately, you would know he was going to charge that girl $100, and that joke I do is all true, though. The lawyers asked to approve the motion, saying it would be it would represent a fair compromise to the plaintiff. Spirit is consistently ranked one of the worst airlines in the United States, and the settlement is not the only issue it's had. Last week, a woman on the airline confused her eczema for MPOX and accused them of anti-gay discrimination. In mid-August, another woman said she was struck on the tarmac on a spirit flight, oh, stuck on the tarmac for seven hours without explanation. Okay, well, if I'm on a plane for seven hours without explanation, I'm calling 911, Mm -hmm. and I'm not kidding. No. No, why can't I? Exactly. That'll get that plane moving. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I'll just keep calling it over and over and over. I'll become the old lady that's completely crazy. (laughs) (laughs) 911, what's your emergency? Well, um, I was an idiot. And bought a ticket on Spirit Airline. Sorry. And I'm stuck outside. Um, this is a one in a million. Yes. You're going to have to go to the, sh- to the show notes or Google it yourself. Yep. A Maine lobster. Yes. But it's one in a million because it's not the blue ones. No. Those are one in a million. This is one in 100 million. Wow. It's rainbow colored. Stop. Yeah, this guy <gasps> This one is a cool-looking lobster. It's taking multicolored to the next level. The video was posted by Jacob Knowles, a fifth-generation lobsterman here in Maine. A lobsterman. (laughs) Jake posted the video recently on his TikTok page, and it blew up. I guess we can call him a cotton candy lobster. (laughs) Or possibly a rainbow-colored lobster, considering he's got all kinds of hues coming out of him. The fact that he has a blue claw growing in 
his sp- he's got a blue call g- growing in. Jake points out that other tones throughout the blue lobs, tones of blue throughout the lobster, it, but it's also got yellows and oranges. Oh, it's it's a pretty rare find, no question about that. How rare? Well, it depends on how, you cl- how this lobster is classified. Assuming it's a rainbow lobster or cotton candy, then the sources will tell you the odds it's catching is one out of 100 million. Now it like, makes a lot more sense that Jake said he never caught one that looked like that before. The story doesn't end there because his life is gonna, the lobster's life is going to change forever. Since the lobster was, this, was of size and not a female, he didn't throw it back. Instead, it's coming home to live with him, kind of. It will be living in the tank at his shop for folks to go and see. Oh, good for him. This is just another viral video. It had 250,000 views on TikTok. Oh so go on TikTok if you want to see that. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I haven't gone to the video. I only saw the pictures. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really pretty. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> moving on. Yeah. Moving on. Here's another point of contention. We'll see how the termites feel about this. Okay. Um, well, this is a huge update. I forgot about this. Fast food update. The powers that be at Taco Bell have chosen one city and one city only as the testing ground for a new chicken item. Okay. Yep, it's Taco Bell's new crispy chicken nuggets. Guess, <laughs> guess what city gets oh, to try them? No. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I thought about it. I don't want to go to Taco Bell for McNuggets, but there's probably parents that they know the parents want Taco Bell but the kids always want McNuggets. So if Taco Bell can or offer, I'm making all this up in a marketing meeting I didn't attend. <laughs> I don't know why they're doing it. I'm never going to Taco Bell for chicken McNuggets. It's yeah. never happening. So but maybe they, if I'm the mom and I'm like, I really want a couple tacos, but I got to feed these monsters in the back and they want McNuggets, now I can go to Taco Bell. It's a compromise. It's a compromise. It's win-win. The chosen city? <laughs> Minneapolis. Stop. Minneapolis termites, are you out there? Wow. I know some of you are there. Get on down there wow. and tell us what's happening. Um, we're supposed to taste the mambo sauce, too, at McDonald's. The mambo sauce at McDonald's. Yeah, we're going to try that. I hardly ever go to McDonald's. Um, I love their breakfast. What are our opinions on self-checkout, termites? I love it. You love it, Paddles? Yes. Sometimes. I'm not that crazy. Do you care that it put people out of work? No. Are you a... Are you, no? Okay. <laughs> You can just bring, bring your right wing self right to the table. <laughs> Fuck people. Fuck them. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I I care that I am doing the job and I don't even get to go in the employee break room. Can I have a free pomegranate or something? I mean, what do I get? It's I'm an employee. <laughs> Target and Walmart turning away from self checkout. After customers backlash, and there's an especially annoying factor, retailers, da, 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 they're, the customers are complaining too much. I also think there's a lot of theft. Right. I also think when I self-check myself out at Walmart, which right. I don't like to go to, I'm only forced to a few times for certain things. I'll admit it. I have to go sometimes for yeah, certain things. Mm-hmm. No. Um, no, sometimes the groceries, the Nashville produce is terrible, and I don't understand why. Because... We're close to the south. Right. Um, Walmart's always got avocados. That's just the bottom line. They do have a lot of avocados. Yeah. Yep. Good. I don't like to, but anyway, self-checkout anywhere, okay? Uh-huh. When I walk out with that receipt, I do not feel like that person scanning it actually scanned it. I don't care. I'm not stealing. But when they look at it and, and there's like, I got like a hundred things on here for a big shop. Right. And they'll go, yeah, have a good day. <laughs> you didn't fucking read that. I know you didn't. No. I don't care. I'm not stealing. Nope. Um, uh, customers online have vocally voiced their issues with self checkout. Um, with the number of, when you use it with the number of cashiers that have work have working is reduced. I don't like the fact that I'm doing a job and not getting paid for it. Well, this lady wants a discount. Well, um, yeah. Um, not all are shopping is having issues with using the kiosk, but stores are running into their own problems as well. Well, I don't like it if I buy beer and then I have to wait for somebody to come check my ID. It's really slow. Yeah, mm-hmm. it can be very slow. Yeah. Um, any kind of thing over 21. Higher rates of theft. If you had a retail store where 50% of transactions worth, 
were through self checkout, losses would be seventy seven percent higher. Customers should not um, are not very good at scanning reliably. Well, I didn't have training. <laughs> I mean, come on, you just threw me on the job. I'm go. just it's on the job training. Here's your gun. Um, I don't know. Target announced they're working on establishing anti-theft measures, which would make stealing from self-checkout less likely to happen. Lowe said the secret to their low theft is they have a lot of um, employees out on the floor. Yeah. They do. But they're all helpful. Which is great. That's why I like self-checkout. That's why I like... Nobody has enough employees. Well, Lowe's does... Walmart revealed is removing self-checkout altogether from three stores in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh. Albuquerque, what are you doing, dirty birds? Mm-hmm. Are you stealing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you might be. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the issues with self-checkout, two out of three shoppers would prefer it over traditional checkout. Well, there you go, paddles. Well, I find it annoying if the lines are too long at shoppers. Yes, 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 yes. Um, At least it gives you something. Well, f- yeah, it gives you something to do rather than just stand there and play right. on your phone. Right. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this story is so strange to me. And then we're going to wrap it up, termites. Because I have to go do another podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's some NPR game show or something. I don't know. Do you win money? I don't think I win anything. No. Why are you doing that? I don't know. Because Katie, my publicist, will tell me I have to. Somebody's gonna have to run this tech shit. I don't know how. Whenever they send the emails, and I'm like, it, I wouldn't do any of this if I didn't have somebody to do it. I would just say no. Call me. Well, That's how I'm, I do media. Call me. I'm gonna do a walkout. I hate zooms. I have to go take a shower and put on makeup. No, right. Uh, Whatever. It might be fun. A Minnesota man has pleading pleaded guilty to stealing the Wizard of Oz ruby slippers from the Judy Garland <gasps> Museum. Oh my god. Here's what you don't know. There's many pairs of those slippers. There's what? Yep. No. A mystery surrounding oh. the theft of pair of the ruby slippers that played a pivotal role in the iconic 1939 film The Wizard of Oz has come to a close. Terry John Martin, 76 years old, pleaded guilty to taking them from the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, where the actor once lived. Once lived. He took him in 2005. I did not know she was from Minnesota. Or she lived in Grand Rapids. Judy Garland. Yep. Yeah. I know. Um, Martin used a sledgehammer to break through the museum's glass door and display a case before making off with his shoes. While they were recovered in an FBI sting in 2018 and have since been returned to their owner, a private Hollywood memorabilia collector who had loaned them to the museum, the thief's identity long remained uncertain. Martin was indicted by a federal grand jury in May and maintained his innocence in June, but he finally pleaded guilty on Friday. At the time of the crime, he believed the shoes were made from actual gemstones, he said. And when he discovered that their sparkle was mere Tinseltown magic, he ditched them. I didn't want to have anything to do with them, he told Judge Patrick Schultz. The shoes were insured for a million dollars at the time. The FBI put their value at three point five million. Now they're one of five known surviving pairs from the movie. Another one is on display at the Smithsonian Museum of American History yes, in DC. Seen them. That's where you've yes, seen them. Yes. There's fraud. Fraud. Fake news. There's five pairs. Fake news. Um, he arrived in a wheelchair. The guy wearing a mask with an oxygen tank. He was trying to ascertain. Um, that Martin was a sound mind and, and uh, understood potential consequences. I think he wanted to take responsibility, his lawyer said, and a move on with his life with what little life he has left. A trial hanging over your head or doing these things while you're trying to get your end of affairs just didn't seem like worthwhile to him. They've agreed on a plea deal while the de- de- details have not been made public. It, But it does, the deal does avoid jail time. Yeah, I don't think, I don't, come on. But where was the Wizard of Oz one? In Kansas. I went to it. That's the museum. The museum. Oh. Were the red slippers in there? No. Pictures of them. Um, asked why his client decided to plead guilty. Now the attorney said, I think when someone is at the end of their life and they're making decisions that are right for their affairs. And I mean, the short answer is because he's guilty. It's in Wanigo, Kansas. Where? 
Wamigo. I stopped on the way to Salina, Kansas, to see my boyfriend, Sean Cassidy. Yes. Judy Garland was born in Grand Rapids. She was born in Grand Rapids, and then they fled to California for riches and fame. Francis Gum. I know their last name is Gum. All right, termites. Here's where we're going. Hang on a sec. We have to talk about the DVDs. Oh, the DVDs. We're putting them on the website. So a bunch of you guys said you would want a DVD. So I'm gonna throw them up on the website. I didn't know if anybody still use their DVD players. I still have one, and I have a CD player in my Mercury Mariner. But I thought, well, a lot of people have already moved on from that. So at some point soon, they will pop up on the website, and then you can. Um, and there's not a ton left. I mean, there's too many for this house. I need them out of the house. It's taking up room in this house. The walls are closing in. I'll keep one for each niece and nephew. And then when I'm old and dead, they can go, oh, look, can't play this anywhere. <laughs> Here's where we're going. Fort Worth, boom. Houston, boom. St. Louis, Denver, two shows. Two, 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 two. The Villages, two shows. Eugene, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, then... Starting in January, Wichita, Tulsa, Santa Rosa, Wheatland. Those are the makeup dates. Um, and Monterey. Oh, San Luis Obispo. I love saying that. San Luis Obispo. Monterey. Birmingham, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia. Birmingham and, Alba and Al Atlanta. The tickets are selling so great. Well, they're all selling good. Thank you, Termites, for everybody who bought one. But I wasn't quite expecting that. It was yeah, wonderful. Andrew will be at those. Um Fort Worth and Houston, I forget who's, uh, Mike Palisak. Michael Palisak, he's very funny, St. Louis, Chris Voth, a Denver comic, he's flying in, Denver, John Novosad, these are the opening acts, in case you care, Eugene, Portland, Seattle, Michael Palisak, which, and then I don't remember all, after all that, it's too much to remember, it's written, down. it's written down somewhere, mm -hmm. it'll be fun, all right, termites, enjoy the fall, is it Halloween week, yeah, yeah. is it? Oh, yeah, sag after the union put out, I saw it on the Today Show, put out a thing telling their members not to dress up like popular characters in movies. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is this for adults? Is this a memo for adults that I'm not allowed to dress up like Mario? Yes. Or, I mean, I just was like, really, sag after? I mean, I think I'm, I'm a member of that, but I'm not an actor, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really end. Oh, I got to end on two quotes. I forgot. Oops. Yeah, and the woman who sent it sent me her name, and I forgot to print it out. I'll do it next week. I think it was Stephanie. Yeah, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah. All right, here's a quote from Dolly. These are just random. Oh, my God, I opened it to the exact same page I did last time. <gasps> How weird is that? <gasps> Whoa. Let's try again. Creepy. <laughs> um, I've been fortunate enough to see dreams come true. In my case, I have, but I paid my dues. I always say I'm going to give to God the credit, but I definitely want the cash. <laughs> Good one, Dolly. Good and how about Tay Tay? What's yeah. Tay Tay got to say today? I would very much like to be excluded from this narrative. Oh. She said that on Instagram. Oh, I did. And then she said on VH1, as soon as I accomplish one goal, I replace it with another one. I try not to get too far ahead of myself. I just say to myself, all right, well, I'd like to headline a tour. And then I get there, and then we'll see what my next goal is. Huh. Yeah. Very millennial. Very millennial. Well, I don't I do this. I don't set goals. I know. I don't like the pressure of it either. Oprah, you can just take that speech and give it somewhere else. I'm not a goal setter. Nope. I'm a let's go to the bar and see what happens type of lady. Yeah. So, anyway, enjoy the week, termites. Night-night.